pre-sentence report uh, that the court reviewed, um, and let me just indicate for the record that I have reviewed uh, the letters that have been submitted uh, on behalf of the defendant, Ms. Brennan, and uh, prepared for sentencing. Any additions, corrections, or deletions, uh, Mr. William, Ms. Cobb, uh, with regards to the pre-sentence investigation report? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Attorney General's office? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Both parties have received both uh, the Attorney General's memo as well as the uh, memo from Ms. Brennan with regards to the guidelines in this case, and both parties agree that the guidelines are zero to six months. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. With you on behalf of the defense. Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. Thank you. Your Honor, I know you've read the materials. Um, in our written materials, what we've outlined are the bases that we rely on as reasons for following the recommendation of the probation department. Ms. Brennan be sentenced to a term of probation that does not include a term of jail. Um, these bases generally are Ms. Brennan's remorse, acceptance of responsibility, the significant consequences she has already had as a result of her conduct and her history of service to Livingston County. Um, Ordinarily, if I were standing in this position with a 63-year-old first-time nonviolent offender and zero to six months guidelines, um, I would be thinking that straight probation would be the normal outcome. Um, we recognize this is not an ordinary case, however, because of Ms. Brennan's position as judge at the time of the offenses. But um, as we've detailed in our materials, and actually as the people have detailed in their materials, Ms. Brennan has had the pri privilege of being a judge stripped from her in a very public, um, very humiliating um, set of hearings. She was removed from the bench and she will never be a judge again. Um, the same is gonna be true for her law license that is currently under an automatic interim suspension as a result of the plea just awaiting <coughs> today's judgment. So, Your Honor, we um, ask you to consider those significant consequences. Um, the loss of her ability to be a judge and a lawyer has been a devastating one for her. And when you add that to the fact that she's now going to be a convicted felon and potentially well, subject to felony probation with that type of a big hammer, we believe that the um, sentencing goals of um, deterrence and punishment um, are, are, are met with an additional probationary sentence without any jail. Now, Your Honor, there has been a lot of immediate attention to Ms. Brennan and her legal troubles over the last several years. Um, one of the things that has not gotten any attention and that I, we have highlighted in our written materials, but I just wanted to speak on it a bit, are, is Ms. Brennan's history of service to Livingston County, not just as a judge, but also just as a citizen, and also the very positive impact she has had on the lives of many, many people. We've submitted a number of letters to you, Your Honor. I'm sure you've read them. We had a very big stack of them, um, and they were rolling in even today. Um, there are simply a lot of people that support her, and I'm sure this courtroom has any number of people that would be willing to say nice things about her. Um, we submit this information to you, Your Honor, not to minimize what she has done, but just to point out that we're all the same. We all have good things that we've done 
and we all have bad things that we've done. And for Ms. Brennan, the bad, of course, is this case and the circumstances that have surrounded it for the last couple of years. But the rest of it is pretty darn good. Um, she's 63 years old. She's never been in any trouble. She's a productive person. She's a hard worker. She has a generous heart. She gives her time and talents to other people. She's loved by her family and friends, needed by her family and friends, and actively giving in her community. And finally, Your Honor, I just wanted to point out that there really has been a lot of change for the good in Ms. Brennan over the last three years. What started as um, emotionally driven, really bad decision making by her at the beginning of her, of her divorce really spun out and um, she has faced challenge after challenge after challenge over the last three years, culminating, of course, with us being here today for a felony sentencing. Um, this has all been very public. She's received a lot of loud and harsh criticism, but as we would hope to see from someone who truly accepts responsibility for what they did, and who truly is remorseful. Um, none of this has resulted in her being angry or um, resentful or deflecting blame. It's been quite the opposite. It's resulted in her being humbled. Um, it's resulted in her having a lot of positive personal growth and just a overall improvement in her outlook and perspective. Now, this, of course, was not easy, and it did not happen overnight, and it was a process, and I think she probably will talk to you more about it, Your Honor, but I'm sure you've read her statement in the pre-sentence report. Um, this was very difficult, and she went through some really dark, dark times, but she did the work, and she continues to do the work because she wants to come out on the other side of this thing a better person. Because upon reflection, she realizes that not only did her behavior, was it below what we expect of judges, it was below what she expects of herself. And that's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you very much, Ms. Scott. Anything else on behalf of the defense? Your Honor, I believe Ms. Brennan would like to address the court. Okay, Ms. Brennan, you can address the court. Please stay behind the podium. <coughs> Your Honor, uh, I've, I've struggled with how to convey to you my remorse and shame. <clears throat> that I feel because of what I've done. I know you read the letter that I wrote, and I wasn't going to read any part of it here today because I don't think I'd be able to make it through. But I think that it's important that the public know I have taken this so seriously. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to read a little bit of it. No good answer exists as to why I lied to Mr. Kaiser during my divorce deposition. That was ignorant, foolish, and wrong. I'm devastated. I lost my career, and I'm a villain. My husband and I, we didn't have children. As a result, we threw ourselves into our careers. For years, I defined myself by what I did, and I believed I was doing something that was purposeful because of my actions. I've lost that. Now, I appreciate that the public now has a more negative view of judges and lawyers because of what I did. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the opposite. My family and friends have suffered because of my actions. I hate that I put them through this. I've been publicly shamed, I'm humiliated, and I am embarrassed.
I began journaling. And I'm going to read a portion of what I wrote this summer of 2019. I have never broken down in front of you. I've been stoic. I've been steadfast in my determination to show strength when around my family and of friends and of course in public. My brother told me he wants to emulate my strength, something like that, that I'm a role model for his boys. My dad wrote me a letter and told me I was his hero, that he'd not had a hero since my mom died. I am none of those or that. And it's simply living my life the only way I know how. My suffering reached a point to where I wondered how to die. A gun, pills, hanging, drowning, driving into a tree, asphyxiation, but I'm not that weak. I have sobbed more in the past three years than my entire life. And I have buried a mother and a sister curled up in a fetal position, lying on the floor because I could not hold up my weight. The type of sobbing that scares you because your mind and body ache beyond recognition, where you're gasping for air. I pray for night and dread at dawn. At night, I held a rosary as I fell asleep. When I would awake, I would pull the comforter over my head, creating a cocoon. Fall and winter were a welcome relief because darkness arrives sooner. I've watched my father age. I've seen him weep uncontrollably. The shame I felt, the fear of going into a store, anywhere in public because of the stairs, never knowing when I'd be confronted, the embarrassment of giving anyone my last name. I begged on my knees the universe to make it stop. I think I am to a place where the tears stop and they come again and again. I believe I have believed I am unworthy of respect. I have believed I have lived a wasted life, that my entire life has been a failure. I have believed I am worthless. I have believed I will never be deserving of love. Do you not understand? I am broken. <sighs> You know, I am consumed with guilt. I have failed in so many ways. I failed so many people. I have let down and caused indescribable suffering for my family and friends. They have given me unconditional love and support, which I don't deserve. Over time, I hope to be able to repay them for what I have, they have done for me. My actions have resulted in me letting down my community, those that elected me, those that I worked with. I've disgraced the legal perfection, profession. Someone I asked to write a letter for me said that he believes we should not be judged by our worst or our best. I pray that's true. This is my worst. I have learned invaluable lessons about myself over these past three years, lessons I promise. It's gonna allow me to make amends. Recently, I was attending a funeral and there was this reading from Proverbs and there was a phrase that struck me that was, humility before honor. Somewhere along the line, I lost my ability to be humble. This has humbled me. I don't feel sorry for myself. I blame only myself. I know I have much to be grateful for. I ask for mercy. Thank you, Ms. Brennan. Anything on behalf of the defense? Anything else? No, you're out. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anything on behalf of the people? Did the court want to address the uh, root issue? Uh, uh, do you have any, do you have any uh, Mr. Root? Uh, uh, Mr. Root, pursuant to the uh, Private Rights Act, can speak. 
Um, I, I've spoken with this council, Mr. Kaiser. Uh, Mr. Root uh, is not in the building. He did not uh, come to court today. He hopes the court has read uh, his correspondence. Uh, and I believe the court has that. Is that correct? I have. Okay. And I, and I think I also. Okay. Very good. Um, with that in mind, then, if I can allocute, Judge. Okay. Um, and the reason, just so, so the record, pursuant to the Crime Victims' Rights Act, I did believe that that met the standard based on what was represented in the court at the time of the plea. Uh, and uh, well, we can move forward. Thank you. And I, and I did inquire, Mr. Kaiser, if he felt that his client was incapacitated, you know, uh, and he had indicated he did not think he was. I mean, okay. he was able to converse and whatnot, but that. With that in mind, um, Judge, I know you've received our uh, sentencing memorandum. And uh, a couple of points here. I, I, I agree uh, with Ms. Cobb that uh, this isn't the average case. And all we have to do is look around the courtroom to see the public interest in it. And we understand it's, uh, it's, it's not the average case. And you know, I and I and I sincerely and genuinely uh, uh, agree with uh, Miss Brennan's observations that no, I don't think we are judged or should be judged by our worst days, nor by our best days. I mean, usually the truth of the matter it falls somewhere in between. And I uh, and I, I embrace that uh, uh, position and I agree with it. Uh, now, with that in mind, I think the thing that uh, is is worth spending a little bit of time on in this case uh, are really two facts. One, which is obvious, at the time that she committed the offense of perjury, she was a sitting state district court judge. And we obviously expect more from our judiciary or members of the judiciary than, uh, than perjury during anything, whether it be a deposition during a divorce matter or in open court. Uh, the position of trust that she held is relevant for the court's consideration. And the, the reason that I say that is uh, because of the knowledge of the, the wrongfulness of the conduct is present at the time that it's committed. It can't be said that the individual later realized, well, my gosh, I didn't realize that the, the, the falsehood that I told was, uh, you know, while I was under oath or that it was a crime. I mean, clearly, given her position, I mean, Ms. Brennan uh, was aware of the importance of the oath in following the oath. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sorry that she went through what she has just uh, outlined for the court during the last three years. But to be quite frank, um, this is, and I think she probably understands this, is it's conduct that she brought upon herself in regards to uh, the criminal charges that she faces. I mean, nobody uh, made her perjure herself. Now, uh, with that in mind, I mean, first point being her position, I turn to a second point, and you know, doing what we do day in and day out, whether you might be a, a neurosurgeon or a, 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 a an engineer for uh, that builds highways or buildings or a lawyer, you know, you become accustomed to your environment after a while. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the men who, and women who do honest physical labor, even though uh, it would be challenging to maybe others to do it day in and day out, after a while they become, you know, steeled to it and they're able to accomplish it. And one of the things that I think is worth noting in this particular case is this thing that we do that we call the practice of law whether you're an advocate, whether you're a member of the bench, uh, it is never, A, to be taken for granted, the right to practice it, and B, the import or the, the, the requirement, the, 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 the cornerstone in every county courthouse across our state, uh, you know, shouldn't have the word truth. Uh, impressed upon it. And then the point that I get to is 
you know, we come in these rooms, we come in these courtrooms every day, we litigate, we advocate, we, uh, uh, you know, we practice our craft. But the cornerstone of what we do is truth. It is not uh, falsicity. And it is falsicity, it is, uh, that is the darkness that really can uh, take justice and uh, set it on a different path uh, than where it should be going. The tolerance of perjury can never uh, be allowed. Now, at the same time, uh, you know, I invite the court, obviously, to, uh, you know, think of the, uh, the good deeds that Ms. Brennan may have done over the past, but at the end of the day, why we're here is while she was a member of the bar and while she was a member of the judiciary, she made a decision. And that decision was to perjure herself during her deposition uh, and through her litigation involving Mr. Root. Um, that is, I, I understand her points uh, and also Ms. Cobb's points uh, that are very well made about the things that she's lost and the price that she has paid. And those are relevant considerations. I, I can't hide from that. But that being the case, the, uh, the notion that uh, it was a mistake or something of inconsequential uh, 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 merit, uh, I think is misplaced. I, you know, the, uh, the, the perjurous act that she made judge uh, as you know, a member of the bench uh, I think uh, I'm going to offer the court uh, my opinion, and I think she ought to, uh, the court should sentence her uh, to the top end of the guidelines. I think a uh, six-month uh, uh, jail sentence uh, is uh, appropriate in this case. Uh, with that in mind, Judge, I'm grateful for the court's time, and I'll yield now. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ralston. Anything else from either side before the court imposes sentence? No, thank you, Your Honor. Um, well, first of all, uh, let me let me first commend the attorneys in this case because uh, I think that the attorneys for uh, Ms. Brennan, Mr. William, Ms. Cobb, and the attorneys for the people of the state of Michigan, the Attorney General's Office, uh, Mr. Ralston and Mr. Grano have shown an uh, enormous amount of uh, professionalism over the past uh, six months. So I appreciate that from both sides. Uh, let me first also indicate uh, to Ms. Brennan that you may file an appeal in conviction for leave. Uh, for, uh, you may file an application for leave to appeal your conviction and sentence. If you cannot afford to hire an attorney, the court will appoint an attorney and furnish the attorney with the transcripts and file necessary for you to handle your appeal and your request for an attorney must be made within 42 days. Now, with regards to some aspects of the sentence, I will indicate that uh, you must perform 200 hours of community service, you must obey all court orders, you must not engage in any assaulted, abusive, threatening, or intimidating behavior, you must not have verbal, written, electronic, or physical contact without permission of the field agent, with anyone you know to have a felony record, and must not have verbal, written, electronic, or physical contact with anyone you know to be engaged in behavior, it constitutes a violation of any criminal law of any unit of government. You must not use any object as a weapon. You must not own, use, or have under your control or area of control a weapon of any type or any imitation of a weapon. And you must not be in the company of anyone you know to possess these items. You must comply with written and verbal orders made by the field agent. And you must allow the field agent into your residence at any time during probationary supervision. You must submit to a search of your person and property, including but not limited to your vehicle, residence, and computer without the need of a warrant if the field agent has reasonable cause to believe you have items which violate the conditions of your probation. You must report any arrest, police contact, and property, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, loss of employment or change of residence within 24 hours, weekends and holidays accepted. You must comply with DNA testing and pay a $60 fee State costs in the amount of $68. Crime victims assessment in the amount of $130. Court costs in the amount of $550. Uh, 
you are prohibited uh, from the use of any controlled substance with regards to uh, any issues of controlled substance use. And you might, may be detained for up to 72 hours without a warrant by a probation officer or any law enforcement official, uh, officer uh, if you have been alleged to have violated your probation. Now, the court has a decision to make, and the court is bound within the guidelines that were agreed upon by the parties of zero to six months. And let me first indicate the first responsibility of any judge is to uphold the law. And our system of law is eroded, and there is a lack of trust in our judicial system. If people who are tasked with upholding the law decide to subvert it for their own personal gain, now, Ms. Brennan, uh, you have taken several oaths in your life. You took an oath first uh, when you became an attorney. This is the same oath that every attorney in the state of Michigan takes. And part of that oath was, and I will quote, I will employ for the purpose of maintaining the causes confided in me such means only as are consistent with truth and honor. I will never seek to mislead the judge or jury by any artifice or false statement fact or law. You also took a judge, Ms. Brent, uh, took an oath when you became a judge, Ms. Brent. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and the laws of the State of Michigan. And when you were a judge, you required, as all judges do, people who came before you to tell the truth. It doesn't matter if it was a family law case, or a civil case, or a criminal case. You required them to tell the truth. And the reason you, like all judges, required people that came before them to tell the truth is because the whole purpose of a criminal proceeding or a civil proceeding or a family law proceeding, <coughs> any court proceeding, it really is a search for the truth. And when individuals come into court or go to a deposition and knowingly lie, that undermines that search for the truth. That is why we have perjury as a serious crime in Michigan, because our society simply does not accept people who come, actions in which people come into court and lie, or come to a deposition and lie. I don't doubt that you regret your actions, Ms. Brennan. I don't doubt that uh, you were genuine with what you said. And I appreciate what you had to say. But there's also another oath that you took, and you took an oath during the deposition in your divorce case, another oath, and you swore to tell the truth in that deposition. And that's why we're in court today. Because on that day, you decided that you would lie to benefit yourself and to protect yourself. And Even though you made others and required others to tell the truth, when it came your time to have to raise your hand to tell the truth, you decided that you weren't going to do it. And so the request for probation, as far as this court is concerned, based on these actions, which are utterly unacceptable for a person who took an oath many times, or a couple of times, to uphold the law, requires others to tell the truth. A probationary sentence under those circumstances would be wholly inadequate. These actions, it would be an understatement to say, uh, are unacceptable. And that behavior is unacceptable. And a jail sentence in this case, for those reasons, would be more than appropriate, as far as this court's concerned. And it will be the sentence of this court the sentence was Brennan within the guidelines that were agreed upon to six months in the county jail, followed by 18 months probation. Is there anything for either side? No, Your Honor. With regards to uh, anything with regards to the jail sentence? Um, no, Your Honor. I guess our, our only request in that, in that vein would be that um, she be allowed to be given a report date uh, to make arrangements. Uh, Mr. Ralston, is there any objection on behalf of the Attorney General's office uh, if the court does uh, agree to a 
report date, it would have to be a short uh, period of time. What's the Attorney General's office's position on that? Um, two thoughts that I have. Uh, number one, I, I mean, clearly that's within the discretion of the court and it's allowable. Um, the um, what I'm thinking of is the sheriff. Uh, the sheriff uh, may or may not have some logistical issues with housing Miss Brennan, and uh, given that obvious, you know, quality of the case, I think it's probably appropriate <coughs> to go ahead and. Uh, I, but I, I mean, I'm assuming the court is. We're talking about a number of days here. I mean, not not, not weeks right. or months. Well, there are unique issues to this case, and uh, I believe a. Uh, Report date of Friday, January 24th would be more than appropriate. Any objection? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, there will be zero uh, days credit. I'm sorry. This is only on one count of perjury. Thank you. And, judges, at what time should I, the uh, court, uh, just so we're clear, what, what, what time would you want her to report? At 9 o'clock in the morning on Friday, January 24th. Thank you, Judge. All right, thank you, everyone.